Now I'm recording. So what I will do from here on in is find out how I take this recording and send it to all of you, okay? I'm sorry, but that's uh, what we'll be uh, doing. Okay, so there we go. I think we got all of that. And remember what we just talked about right here is um, I'm admitting somebody. Oh, somebody, two people are in the waiting room. Uh, okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so I got uh, people admitted there. All right. Okay, um, so in, I think that I'll find out from Kimberly Gonzalez uh, good. Allison Ferdinand can record and she'll send it to anybody. Uh, you all got that message. And is there, you think there's a way to put it on Blackboard? I'll find out how to do that and then do that. Again, I'm sorry, I'm a 74 year old rookie here. Okay. So, um, what I think I just did here is go through uh, at least in some general kind of way, um, what uh, is going on. So, the, okay, I think I, has anybody recently just shown up um, on here in the last couple of minutes? Okay, so uh, again, if you're not sure, when I admitted you into each one of the things, I assiduously checked down your name. So, uh, but if you think um, you were not, if you were not uh, included, uh, uh, send me an email or send me a chat message. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is I'm going to move into um, your very first lecture. Okay, so again, what you're going to do is uh, after a certain amount of time, I am going to uh, stop the share, look at the chat, see if there's any questions. So here is uh, basic neuroscience neuroanatomy, uh, lecture one. Welcome to Gross Brain Neuroanatomy. We're going to be going through an awful lot of structures here. Now, one of the things you shouldn't have to worry about is that these structures I'm going to be repeating over and over and over again. Okay? So, what I have in this is, uh, is uh, pictures from uh, two very famous uh, movies. Uh, the uh, move, uh, the one on the left is the actor Ray Liotta in the uh, in the uh, uh, movie uh, called Hannibal, which was the second of the Hannibal Lecter. The first one, of course, was Silence of the Lambs, and Hannibal Lecter's um, hand is there and is about to uh, take off a piece of Ray Liotta's brain. Obviously, what you're looking at right there, if you notice, there's a shininess to that. Does anybody understand why there's a shininess? By the way, I ask lots of rhetorical questions. The reason is, is that what you're basically looking at is not directly brain tissue, but you're looking at meningeal layers that are over the, uh, uh, the brain tissue that has a sort of a glow to it. So you're basically looking at uh, Ray Liotta's, not only his brain, where you can see the convolutions and whatever, but what you're also seeing are these meninges, probably the outer dura matter. Then on uh, the right side is a drawing of the famous or infamous Igor, uh, who was uh, uh, the uh, Baron von Frankenstein's uh, uh, able assistant, and probably the best uh, depiction of Igor was in the famous Mel Brooks movie uh, called Young Frankenstein, uh, in which he was sent downstairs to get uh, the brain for the Frankenstein monster. 
and he was supposed to pick up the brain of the greatest genius in the world, sort of the Einstein at the time. And what Igor then does is drop that brain. It falls into pieces. So he picks up the brain that's next to it that was labeled Abby, A-B-B-I-E, normal. Okay, <laughs> so you know, a mass killer. But in any case, uh, so what we always have, we have uh, in, uh, a lot of neuroanatomy, a, uh, 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 you know, a whole thing in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, movies and books and whatever. So now, let me, okay, why am I not advancing here? Let me go somewhere else to a second. Oh, I have a chat. Uh, yes, I got Brienne. Okay, your uh, your uh, I got I got you in there. Okay, so now let me go back to share screen, and we go here. All right, so. Why am I not, why is the, there we go, very good. Okay, so now the human brain, just some very quick, oh goodness. The human brain uh, is uh, basically the hog of the body. So an average human brain weighs about one and a half kilograms. It's about 2% or sometimes less of body weight. Yet, what we can see is that the human brain consumes 20% of the oxygen of the body. It requires 17% of cardiac output. There's a blood flow of 750 milliliters per minute and an oxygen consumption of 46 milliliters per minute, which is why when all of a sudden our blood supply uh, gets uh, in some way shut off, what you can see is brain damage happening very quickly simply because of the enormous amount of oxygen that is needed, the cardiac output, uh, and uh, whatever. All of a sudden, you become, uh, it becomes starved, and these neurons and glia can die. So now, one of the things that you're basically looking at is uh, the uh, axes of the central nervous system. And the point here is, is that, again, um, I just wanna make sure, can everybody, I don't have me on the, uh, my screen, I have someone else, but everybody can still see me, correct? Good, I see, yes. great, all right, excellent, good. So here we go. Uh, so when you're, if you're thinking about, a horizontal and a vertical axis. If you're looking at my arm here, you can see my arm as the vertical axis. And then you can see my uh, fingers and my hand as the horizontal axis. Yet, what basically happens here? If you basically look at my wrist area, obviously the part of the central nervous system that goes up there is going to be a vertical axis that is that is um, uh, uh, has a perpendicularity and a parallelism, and the same thing with the horizontal axis. So that the horizontal axis is perpendicular to the vertical axis and vice versa. But then we have an enormous part of the upper spinal cord and the uh, my area of the wrist of the medulla and the pons and even part of the midbrain that is in something that is not just horizontal or vertical, okay? So it makes the human brain a bit more difficult. Now, I have a bunch of pets. All of my, uh, 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 I had dogs, I have uh, 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 three cats, I have sheep outside, I have uh, four sheep outside and uh, 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 two donkeys. And of course, when you're basically studying a dog, 
you're basically looking at a very long horizontal axis. Yes, there's going to be a turn as you get into the brain casing. So it becomes much easier to, to look at that if you're four-legged. So you, you don't necessarily uh, see that there. So now, here is the axes of the central nervous system. So the vertical axis is parallel to the spinal cord. So now, if we want to talk about the vertical axis, two particular terms are used um, for the vertical axis. The posterior part of the vertical axis is called the dorsal. The anterior is called the ventral. So very often in many spinal cord structures, we're gonna see the word dorsal this or posterior this versus ventral this or anterior this. Does everybody understand that? In the horizontal axis, here is the eye sockets. And what you're basically doing is the superior is the, uh, 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 is the top, the inferior is the bottom. Okay. So when we start to look at planes of section, when we talk about dorsal or posterior, a lot of the times, we are using the word for the vertical axis that's towards the back. And then if you are using the word superior, it very often is going towards the vertex of the skull. However, realize there's going to be a lot of things in which in the horizontal axis, we'll see the word dorsal. So dorsal and superior in the horizontal axis going towards the vertex of the skull. Ventral or anterior is going towards the stomach because it's on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, inferior or ventral is going towards the palate. Okay? Now, so if we basically look at this, can every, everyone can see my fingers and what I'm doing here? On the, vertical, on the vertical axis, going towards the back is posterior or uh, dorsal. Going towards the stomach is what? Going uh, is a, a, a ventral or anterior. Going towards the vertex of the skull is superior. Going towards the palate is inferior. Now we have other terms. If we are in the vertical axis, rostral is going towards the head. If we are in the vertical axis, caudal is going towards the tail. In the horizontal axis, rostral is going towards the nose. And then caudal is going towards the occiput. Then we have two other terms for both vertical and axis uh, and horizontal. Medial is towards the midline. Lateral is towards the outside. So look at all of the words we ended up using here for superior, inferior, posterior, anterior, dorsal, ventral, rostral, caudal, medial, lateral. You have a whole bunch of written definitions there. What I want you to learn, and maybe you should go in front of a mirror, sometime today is do some sort of a Pilates exercise in which you're pointing in different directions, doing particular things to figure out 
whether you're going rostrally or cordally, medially or laterally, dorsally or ventrally, posterior or inferior, superior or inferior. All of these terms get embedded in a lot of our uh, structures. So sometimes we're gonna have a term that says superior this and then inferior this. What you're not necessarily, what you're basically saying is where these two structures are adjacent to one another and where each of those things are. It becomes hopefully somewhat logical. Okay. So now we have another set of things because very often we're not actually taking somebody and looking uh, inside their central nervous systems or something. We're actually either taking uh, pictures of a section and whatever. And what we can basically do is look at the brain from three different types of directions. And we use these directions because they have a degree of perpendicularity and parallelism. So uh, one type of section is called horizontal section. Another type of section is called a coronal section. And a third type of section is a sagittal section. Now, like I told you, I taught this course starting back in 1979. So in the 1980s, we were treated to enormous numbers of movies, not that I watched many of them, but uh, there were enormous number of uh, uh, crazy psychopath movies in which always some maniac is running around and they're either out in the woods or they're in this thing or, or whatever. And of course, very often their greatest victims are teenagers who always seem to run in the wrong direction. You know, run into a corner of a room, out the door, do, you know, whatever. And so one of the famous guys was a guy named Freddy, Freddy Krueger. If, I'm hoping people, if, if you don't know them, Google the thing, you'll see a million images of them. So what Freddy Krueger did was he ran around with an ax and he would of course hit these people in the head with an ax and kill them. So let's use Freddy Krueger and the visualization of Freddy Krueger in order to sort of understand horizontal, coronal and sagittal cuts. And it's the way that Freddy Krueger took his ax and hit the person on the head. So if Freddy Krueger wanted to do a horizontal cut, he would hit the person's head like this. And he could basically cut, do cuts this way. Now, then a coronal cut, Freddy Krueger would cut like this. And then finally, a sagittal cut, Freddy Krueger would cut like this. So let's look at that in words. A horizontal cut is a cut that is parallel to dorsal and ventral, and it is perpendicular to rostral caudal and medial lateral. The horizontal cut is parallel to dorsal and ventral, or superior and inferior, and perpendicular to rostral, caudal, medial, or lateral. A coronal cut, a coronal cut is parallel to rostral caudal, and it's perpendicular to medial lateral and dorsal and ventral. Notice these words are very, very complex. A picture is worth a thousand words as to seeing the cut. Then a sagittal cut. A sagittal cut is parallel to medial and lateral, and it is perpendicular to rostral caudal and dorsal ventral. So a sagittal cut is this way. Now, <clears throat> all of those cuts are perfectly informative if uh, we, are, uh, we are in a pure vertical axis 
and a pure, a, a pure vertical axis and a pure horizontal axis. But what did I tell you about a lot of the brain? A lot of the brain is not purely vertical and it's not purely, uh, har uh, 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 it's not purely vertical and it's not purely horizontal. What are they? They are typically oblique, an angle other than these perpendicularity and parallelism. So any other cut. So what's the way that one of the ways that we uh, uh, obviously can look at a brain is we can look at a brain post-mortem, but the most typical way that we look at a brain is in a, in a living image. So we use uh, CAT scans, PET scans, or MRI scans. And when they put the person in a, a, a CAT, PET, or MRI scanner, uh, what are you basically uh, doing? You have a person in the head that you can't uh, just all of a sudden make everything either vertical or horizontal. You're gonna have oblique sections. So all of a sudden, uh, at one part of the brain, you might be almost on a dorsal surface. And then as you move caudally, you might now go all the way down to a ventral surface simply because of the angle of the oblique cut. So at this point, I'm gonna stop share for a second. And I see five comments here. Uh, yeah, what is the vertex of the skull? Oh, look, somebody else is asking. Uh, uh, the vertex is the top of the skull, the crown of your head. You know, it's easy to understand your eyeballs. <laughs> it's also easy to understand where your palate is, but there's two terms. One, uh, uh, one term, the vertex of the skull is the crown. And of course, the other term I use, the occiput, is this sort of bump here in the back, okay? And we're gonna see that very quickly. So oblique is not a physical cut. Sure, you can make a physical cut of a, of, a, uh, of a brain that you're slicing, but it's also the way the image is taken and it's the image is taken because of the way the person's head is in the scanner. You, can, you know, um, every so often you look in cartoon type things and you have to see a person with a block head, a perfectly square head. Well, in that case, you would then have you know, a, a vertical thing. We have this strangely shaped head that uh, doesn't allow us to uh, look at things there. So there we go, all right. So before I proceed, does anybody else have any kinds of questions about these cut, you know, and again, you can Google this kind of stuff and look at it with many different things. But the old practice, I, I swear to God, just stand there in front of a mirror going superior. Okay, here, everybody, here we go. Superior, inferior, rostral, caudal, medial, lateral. Then if I'm on the, if I'm in the vertical section, dorsal or posterior, ventral or anterior, medial, lateral, rostral, caudal, okay? If you just get those concepts back down, you start to very quickly understand exactly where one structure is in terms of another structure, okay? So now we'll go back. And now what we will uh, uh, do is uh, now start to look at, now why? There we go. So now we're about to embark upon looking at the gross brain. So there's going to be three very, very big gross, gross ideas that we're gonna look at here on the superior surface. One is something called the longitudinal fissure. The second is something I imagine all of you are familiar with in some way, shape or form, the cerebral hemispheres. 
And then the third thing is the general idea of the cerebral cortex. So how do we do landmarks in looking at gross anatomy and looking at the outer surface of the brain that we're gonna use for the superior surface, we're gonna use this for the lateral surface, we're gonna use this to a certain degree for the inferior surface, and we're then gonna uh, 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 basically look at cortical structures. So everybody here, here, let me again put myself on, oh, looks like Brianne, there we go. Uh, I'm going to stop the share for a second so I can see myself and I'm doing this correctly. Okay, so let's go and imagine that we have, I don't know, a, a newt, a reptile. Here is the newt's, um, here is the newt's uh, brain casing or skull. Here is a newt brain. Notice that the newt brain fits nicely into the newt skull, okay? Now, imagine this. Here is a human brain or a human skull, okay? Here is a human brain, the full cubic centimeter amount of the human brain. I'm trying to put the human brain into the skull. I'm not succeeding, am I? Everybody see that, right? Will I ever be able to succeed? Yes. If I take the human brain and I fold it, and I fold it, and I fold it, I now can stick that human brain inside the human skull and everything is fine, okay? What did I basically do to the brain tissue that is made up of neurons and glia? What I have done is folded them. So that brings us to two major terms. One, is called the uh, gyri or a gyrus, which is literally ridges of the cerebral cortex. It's the actual brain tissue itself. And then the second term is called the sulcus, plural sulci, which is actually fissures uh, between areas of the cortex. It is literally where a lot of these folds have taken place. Now, a sulcus uh, usually uh, talks about a very specific convolution or fold. And then we have large things called a longitudinal fissure, et cetera, et cetera, which is extremely large uh, folds, okay? So we have these terms that basically are describing in some way how the brain uh, became organized and grew within the skull along uh, evolution without uh, creating a larger skull. So now, how am I going to present at least these very beginning types of, uh, of, of, of um, ideas to you? Well, uh, I, had a, I was a history major in college and uh, I graduated in 1967 and the last two years of my college education was paid for by the United States Air Force uh, because I won an ROTC scholarship. I wanted to be a pilot. If I, have a, if I had perfect accommodation back in the day, I probably would have been uh, uh, gone on to pilot school or at least navigator school, and I wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, so basically, um, because I didn't have perfect accommodation, although at the time I had 2020 or 2015 vision, uh, 
uh, I was then uh, assigned to a different thing when I joined the Air Force as a second lieutenant. I became an intelligence officer. And of course, in order to do that, you went to something called intelligence school. Now, uh, one of the things that you do as an intelligence officer is you basically tell other people um, uh, what's basically happening. And as a style of military briefings, and it's broken up into three different aspects. Very simply, in any kind of military briefing, you tell them what you're going to tell them. So you might have a written list of critical structures. Then you tell them, and in this case, I will now have a diagram slide that you're going to label. And then the third thing is, tell them what you told them, in which I give you the written list of structures again. <clears throat> and hopefully, this is going to be helpful for you in terms of understanding uh, some of the gross uh, anatomy. And what we're about to do is we're about to go through an enormous number of slides with an enormous number of things that I'm going to point at. The easiest one to begin with is the superior surface of the brain. So when we look at the superior surface of the brain, what we're going to be basically identifying is the frontal pole, which is rostral, and the occipital pole, which is caudal. It's sort of the, uh, 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 the, the perturbation or bump that you can see rostrally and, uh, and caudally. Then what we're going to see is the longitudinal or interhemispheric fissure. So what you basically notice right here is that when we look at this fissure, uh, it has one of two names, longitudinal or interhemispheric. Then we're going to look at a very major sulcus, which is called the central sulcus. It has an, un, another name called the fissure of Rolando after uh, the Roman neuroanatomist who said, basically, that's mine. I'm going to name my, going to put my name on it. Okay. And what you got, if you have a sulcus, what must you have? Two ridges on either side of the sulcus. So what you can see here is you're going to have the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Okay. They surround the central sulcus. Then we're going to move a little bit uh, quarterly and uh, behind the postcentral gyrus, we're going to identify the angular gyrus, which is in a different lobe. I'll talk about that in a second. And we're going to identify the superior parietal lobule. One thing that you're going to basically notice is that uh, if you look at the superior surface, and you look at the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe, there is no clear subdivision that divides it, no sulcus on the superior surface that says, um, here's the border between those two lobes. Then we're going to move back uh, to the precentral gyrus. And of course, if there's a precentral gy if the precentral gyrus <coughs> is bordered, by on the caudal extent by the precentral sulcus, it is bordered on the rostral extent by the precentral sulcus. Then we're going to identify two other gyri, the superior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus that is separated by the superior frontal sulcus. Look at all of these names. And if you basically sat there and you wrote out this is rostral to this, and this is caudal to that. You don't get it. The easiest way to get it is to look at it, and the picture is worth a thousand words. Now, of course, this is not a picture, but what this is is a diagrammatic thing of an actual picture. Okay, so what are some of the things that we can go and identify? So what I basically told you starting off was the frontal pole. Here is the frontal pole in either hemisphere, okay? Here is the occipital pole 
in the in either hemisphere. The basic difference, if you're looking at the occipital pole versus the frontal pole, is that you can see that there is a greater degree of, uh, of an opening in the occipital pole. Because if we were to look further inferiorly, we would see another structure sitting down here. That structure, whoops. That structure that we would see down here would be the cerebellum, okay? So it becomes, damn it, uh, it would become very, very easy to uh, identify uh, what's rostral and what's caudal on this section because you'd see the cerebellum here. Here you would see virtually nothing. Then what we have here is the longitudinal fissure. Okay, or the interhemispheric fissure. Why is it named the interhemispheric fissure? Because that fissure or large sulcus separates the <clears throat> separates the left hemisphere from the right hemisphere. Boy, okay. So there we go. Uh, so we have the uh, frontal pole, the occipital pole the interhemispheric fissure, or the central fissure. Now, what you can imagine right now, let me again stop share and use my, uh, use my hands for a second. If I would take the brain and I were literally to uh, look at the interhemispheric fissure and put both my thumbs down, and separate out the interhemispheric fissure and peer within, what do you think I would see? What I would see is a major source of interhemispheric communication, and that is called the corpus callosum. Okay, very good. Someone asked in the chat, what is the... Uh, 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 Is the sulcus is synonymous with a fissure? Yes, a fissure is a larger sulcus. Okay, great. All right. So I'm looking down into this opening, and I will literally see a band of fibers crossing longitudinally from one hemisphere to the other. There are three such major sets of fibers. We're talking about one of them now. That's the corpus callosum. But we don't see it on the superior surface. It's buried within the fissure. Okay? So now, let us look at another major uh, sulcus, and that is this sulcus right here, which is the central sulcus or the fissure of Rolando, okay? And again, a sulcus is this fold, it's a, it's a space, but the point of the matter is Everything that you want to know about things. So you go, why the hell is Bodner teaching me about space? Well, one thing that you're going to do is it's a landmark, so you can see what's rostral to it, what's caudal to it, in other cases, what's superior to it versus inferior to it. But on a much more functional level, what takes what is found in this central sulcus? What you're basically going to find within the central sulcus along the superior surface and then the lateral surface is something called the middle cerebral artery. And the middle cerebral artery is the continuation of, uh, of the internal carotid artery, which is the continuation of the carotid artery, which is the first major uh, 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 artery to come off the aorta. So if you remembered way back in the first slide, 
where I told you that the brain is a hog and it basically utilizes uh, 17, uh, 20% of the blood supply, 17% of the oxygen. Basically, what you're seeing is a very major um, artery here, the middle cerebral artery. So the middle cerebral artery is running right in that central sulcus. So now, rostral to the central sulcus is the precentral gyrus. So right here is the precentral gyrus. And right here is the precentral gyrus. So now, the precentral gyrus is rostral to the central sulcus, and it is the most caudal structure in what we call the frontal lobe. Now, how do we define the frontal lobe on the superior surface of the brain? When we are looking at the superior surface of the brain, the frontal lobe is found rostral to the central sulcus. So anything that is rostral to the central sulcus is the uh, frontal lobe. Anything that is caudal to the central sulcus is called the parietal lobe. Now notice here in this diagram, we have an occipital lobe with a dotted line. Why? Like I said before, there is no um, uh, definitive sulcus that separates the parietal from the occipital lobe there. So now we're back to our friend, the, uh, okay, let me, why am I not? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, we're in the uh, uh, central gyrus, the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus has a very powerful function. That powerful function is that it is called the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex. This is an enormous gyrus that has uh, right along, and we're going to see this on the lateral surface as well, from the superior surface of the brain, going out along the lateral sur surface, we're going to see the uh, precentral gyrus, which is primary motor cortex. And the interesting thing about this is that this precentral gyrus is a topographically or somatotopically organized. What does that mean? That a particular part of the uh, precentral gyrus um, corresponds to a particular part of the body and muscles that are controlling that. And this was beautifully shown all the way back in 1876 by uh, uh, Fritz and Hitzig, two uh, German neurophysiologists who basically stimulated different portions, different portions of the um, precentral gyrus uh, in a dog, and then basically demonstrated that different sets of muscles in the dog would be activated by that stimulation. So that is the, uh, get my pointer, the precentral gyrus is right here. So if we go on the other side of the central sulcus, we now have the post-central gyrus. And of course the post-central gyrus on the superior surface of the brain is the most uh, rostral structure in the parietal lobe. So whereas the precentral uh, gyrus is primary motor cortex, the precentral gyrus is primary somatosensory cortex. So this is the endpoint of the somatosensory system
in its projections to the cortex. And again, just like the precentral gyrus, which would somatotopically organize to control muscles, the postcentral gyrus is somatotopically organized to receive somatosensory input. Now, what is the nature of that um, organization? The nature of the somatotopic organization of the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus is that on the superior medial surface here and here, what you would be basically doing is corresponding to, uh, in a human being, uh, the foot and the toes. Then as we move uh, laterally on the superior surface, we get into the leg. And then as we move uh, 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 more laterally and now go to the lateral surface, we would then be into the body, into the arms, into the legs, into the, into the head, uh, and then, of course, all of the things with the lips. So what you have is a sort of upside-down representation of the human body for both motor output with the precentral gyrus, somatosensory input from the postcentral gyrus, uh, 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 you know, represented on uh, the cortical surface. And you have a name for that. The name for that is it's called a homunculus. So again, this goes all the way back into uh, times going back into BC, in which you basically have a little man in your head uh, or a little woman in your head controlling what you're doing. And uh, whoever basically came up with that concept uh, seemed to have some sort of a way that this is represented. And I'll be going into why it's represented and how it's represented uh, right there. So now let us move rostrally. So we have the central sulcus, the precentral gyrus, and now we have the precentral sulcus. Okay? There's the precentral sulcus. So now we're looking at tissue way in the rostral portion of the frontal lobe. And now instead of having the uh, gyri and the sulci organized rostrocaudally, we now rostral to the precentral sulcus have these, uh, have these uh, gyri organized, organized um, uh, horizontally. So we're going to have the rostral to the precentral sulcus. We're going to see the superior frontal gyrus, the superior frontal sulcus, and the middle frontal gyrus. So here we have the superior frontal gyrus. Here we have the superior frontal sulcus, and here we have the middle frontal gyrus. Now what happens? We are now gonna to go to the lateral surface. So when you're looking at the frontal gyri and the frontal sulci, you can basically think about things in terms of, uh, here is the, uh, superior frontal gyrus, here is the middle frontal gyrus, and what we're not seeing on the superior surface is an inferior frontal gyrus. So if you basically think of my fingers as the gyri, and the spaces between my fingers as the sulci, what would you have? You have three gyri and two sulci. And logically, the superior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus is separated by the superior frontal sulcus. The middle frontal gyrus and the inferior frontal gyrus is separated by the inferior frontal sulcus. So everybody, I hope, basically sees that, okay? So now let's move 
quarterly. And what we see here is the central sulcus and the post-central gyrus. Now, there are other sulci out here that have a, a, a much, a, a, not that clear demarcation, so I'm not labeling them. But caudal to the post-central gyrus is now going to be these two very large structures. One structure, which is more superior, and it is medial on the superior surface, is called the superior parietal lobule. The superior parietal lobule. And then what you have as you move lateral to that, the superior parietal lobule, you then have the inferior parietal lobule. Now, the frontal lobe, when we were talking about the superior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus, for those of you who are in neuropsychology, uh, what you always love to do is to take this massive amount of structure right here and ascribe a function to it. And the function is called executive function. It is basically, uh, I am the decider. This is the area, quote, of the brain in which people are making uh, informed decisions, hopefully on the basis of very strong sensations, very ac uh, accurate perceptions, uh, very much uh, use of memory and use of cognition before you make a decision and then these structures will then tell the rest of the body, go down, now make a response and it's going to be brilliant, and it's going to be rational, and it's going to be all of that. And of course, you then have, in the whole area of neuropsychology, executive function uh, deficits. So you basically are looking at the superior uh, frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, the inferior frontal gyrus, involved very much in executive function. Whereas when we move back to the parietal lobe, this is another favorite area of uh, neuropsychology and clinical neuropsychology in particular, with the superior parietal lobule and the inferior parietal lobule, uh, which is um, an area uh, basically involved in what you basically call association. So the parietal lobe very often is called association cortex. So in here, uh, many, many types of pieces of information are, quote, stored. And when we use that term, stored, we're using that term in the classic Pavlovian sense. So when Ivan Pavlov was doing this work in the early 20th century, uh, basically, of course, he went and he demonstrated a very, very simple form of learning and then began to understand that. And that, of course, was classical conditioning. And classical conditioning is taking a heretofore neutral stimulus, pairing it with some unconditioned stimulus uh, that produces a powerful, almost reflexive response, so that with extensive pairing, the conditioned stimulus will now produce a conditioned response that is no different from the unconditioned response. So what Pavlov then did was, well, what he had to then do is say, well, if you have this kind of learning and you demonstrate memory, what you basically need is a, uh, an idea, a function, and a place for this function to occur. And of course, what was that name that Pavlov gave was something called an engram, E-N-G-R-A-M. And his basic idea was, is that the parietal lobe as association areas, making associations and then creating learning, that the engrams were all happening in the parietal lobe. So of course, the parietal lobe is a, a very famous place in clinical neuropsychology for a whole bunch of disorders that have some breakdown 
in um, in, uh, in 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 these associations. So you're going to have agnosias and apraxias and the inability to see faces and associated things. So you get all those wonderful books. You know the most famous one, uh, which was written by Oliver Sacks, which was the man who mistook his wife for a hat. And you can then start to talk about parietal lobe dysfunctions. So one other structure that I want to, and so there, you're looking at the superior and inferior parietal lobules right here, here and here. And then you're looking, you see a tiny little, it doesn't look like a very big sulcus right here on the superior surface down here and here, but that is, that is begin, that's the beginning or the uh, superior surface of the lateral sulcus, which we're gonna see very soon. And the little uh, gyrus, which uh, surrounds the lateral sulcus on the superior surface is called the angular gyrus. So if we now go to this uh, next slide, We have basically covered the frontal pole and the occipital pole, the longitudinal and interhemispheric fissure, the central sulcus or olandic fissure. We've identified the precentral gyrus as primary motor cortex, the postcentral gyrus as primary somatosensory cortex, uh, identified where the angular gyrus is in a parietal lobe, where on the superior surface we're going to see a little of lateral, sur uh, uh, lateral sulcus. The superior parietal lobule, the occipital lobe, and then the precentral sulcus, and then we start to see superior frontal gyrus, superior frontal sulcus, and middle frontal gyrus. So how does this actually look? Oh, so let me uh, uh, just continue with this. Uh, the central sulcus or Rolandic fissure, rush rostral to the central sulcus. Immediate is the precentral gyrus, the primary motor cortex. In general, anything rostral to the central sulcus on the superior surface is the frontal lobe. Caudal to the central sulcus, immediate is the postcentral gyrus or primary somatosensory cortex. In general, uh, the, parietal, uh, 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 the parietal lobe is caudal to the central sulcus but you can't on a superior surface differentiate uh, the parietal and occipital lobes. So now here is an actual uh, picture of an actual brain. So what are we gonna identify here? And again, hopefully you're gonna use your diagram and put it up here, but here is a frontal pole. Here is the occipital pole. Notice the greater opening and what would be underneath that, the cerebellum. Here is the interhemispheric or longitudinal fissure. Then here is the central sulcus. Here is the central sulcus. Here is the precentral sulcus or primary motor cortex. I mean, excuse me, precentral gyrus or primary motor cortex. Here is the postcentral gyrus or primary somatosensory cortex. Then if we are back here with the central sulcus and precentral gyrus, we have the precentral sulcus. And then rostral to that is the uh, superior frontal gyrus with the superior frontal sulcus. And out here on the periphery is the middle, temp, uh, middle uh, frontal gyrus. Then if we go back here, we have the central sulcus, uh, the postcentral gyrus, the superior parietal lobule, the inferior parietal lobule, and the angular gyrus, and then the occipital lobe. So let me do stop share for a second. And do we have any kinds of questions that you'd like to ask about the superior surface? If you do, uh, 
uh, hit the chat or ask to unmute uh, or something like that, and we can go on about that. The ang where is the angular gyrus again? Okay, uh, sure, I'll do that. So the angular gyrus that you're gonna see is, oh, it's easier to see it down here. Here comes the lateral sulcus up and the angular gyrus surrounds that lateral sulcus. That's that. That's different from the occipital lobe, different from the superior parietal lobule and different from the inferior parietal lobule. Okay? All right. So now we move to the lateral surface. The lateral surface has, we're gonna be looking at the central sulcus again in Rolandic fissure. So it's just continuing uh, from the superior surface and running down the lateral surface. And we're able to see that the frontal and parietal lobes are respectively uh, rostral and caudal to the central sulcus on the uh, lateral surface. Then we're gonna see the lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure. And now we're gonna notice that a new lobe, the temporal lobe is inferior uh, to the uh, lateral sulcus and the frontal and parietal lobes are superior to the lateral sulcus on the lateral surface. And then again, looking at the lateral surface, we don't have a clear sulcus demarcating the occipital lobe from either the temporal lobe or the parietal lobe on the lateral surface. So let's start to look at this. So first of all, we're gonna look at the frontal lobe and the lateral surface. So we're gonna be paying attention to the precentral gyrus, the precentral sulcus. Then we're gonna see three big gyri, the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus that are organized sort of in the horizontal stacks from superior surface towards the vertex to the inferior surface going towards the palate. Moreover, the inferior frontal gyrus is huge. And the inferior frontal gyrus, we're gonna see as was classically separated into three parts. And the word pars is a part. There's gonna be called the pars opercularis, the pars triangularis, and then the pars orbitalis, otherwise known as Broca's area. So let's look at the frontal lobe and the lateral surface. So, the first thing you're recognizing is we're way out on the lateral surface. And uh, what we want to see is, is there a continuation from the superior surface? And of course there is. So you have, here's our friend, the central sulcus. And notice the central sulcus runs all the way down into another sulcus called the lateral sulcus. So here is the lateral sulcus right here, okay? And the lateral sulcus, if you remember what did I tell you about the central sulcus, other than being a ridge, it contains within it the middle cerebral artery. And how did the middle cerebral artery get into the central sulcus? It's because this middle cerebral artery also ran in from the internal carotid into the lateral sulcus. So within the lateral sulcus, there's the middle cerebral artery that continues up the central sulcus, and then some other arteries that I'll identify later that will uh, go uh, up from there. So we have a lateral surface and we have a 
a, a, a lateral sulcus and we have a central sulcus. So first order of business is to define the frontal lobe. On the superior surface, we define the frontal lobe as rostral to the central sulcus. On the lateral surface, we can define the frontal lobe as being what? Rostral to the central sulcus and superior to the lateral sulcus. So any structure that is rostral to the central sulcus or superior to the lateral sulcus is called a frontal lobe. Conversely, anything that is caudal to the central sulcus and superior to the lateral sulcus is called the parietal lobe. And then finally, anything that's inferior to the lateral sulcus is called the temporal lobe, and we'll be covering that pretty soon. So now let's go through the frontal lobe structures first. So we have the central sulcus, we have, oh, damn it, We have the precentral gyrus. And if you remember, it's somatotopically organized. So now we're on the superior portion and now we're going laterally. So what are we seeing? Remember our upside down homunculus? Now we'd be looking at things like uh, 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 the head area and the neck area and the arms and then the body and then maybe the upper portions of the legs. Then we have the precentral sulcus. And then what we have is the superior frontal gyrus right here. Excuse me, superior frontal gyrus right here. The superior frontal sulcus right here. The middle frontal gyrus right here. And then the inferior frontal sulcus right here. And then this enormous portion right here is now called the inferior frontal gyrus. Now, we divide the inferior frontal gyrus into three arbitrary parts. The first part is called the pars opercularis. Now, operculum is Latin and the word uh, operculum uh, roughly translates into a slit. So you could see those neuroanatomists calling this thin area the pars opercularis uh, 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 of the inferior frontal gyrus. Now here is where I think people went crazy because right here is the second portion of the inferior frontal gyrus called the pars triangularis. And just like you look up at a constellation in the sky, there's some of you that can see Orion's belt. All that I see is stars. I challenge any of you to see a um, triangle here, okay? But then the whole rest of this is called the inferior, damn, the inferior frontal gyrus pars orbitalis. And it is called the pars orbitalis because what would be sitting right here? Your eyeball, okay? Your eyeball would be right here. If I ever get the cursor again. Where's my cursor? Here we go. So the eyeball is right there. So this is the pars orbitalis. This is an enormous number, millions of neurons. And of course, the whole point here is what we're doing is we're looking at the, <coughs> um, the left cerebral hemisphere um, because this is rostral and that's caudal. And uh, you're looking at these millions of neurons. And of course, there is on the right side a pause orbitalis of the um, of the uh, uh, inferior frontal gyrus. And 
uh, there are some studies that are done in classic work that literally identified uh, a particular finding. So I pointed out with Fritz and Hitzig being the first people to identify the importance of motor activity and muscle control with the precentral gyrus. So the looking at the inferior frontal gyrus pars or patalis, another person came along and identified this enormous area for a particular function and very much for a very important neuropsychological function. The person who made that discovery was a neurologist by the name of Paul Broker back in 1870, in which he, uh, uh, he uh, uh, identified a patient who was with him who had died. And then what uh, Paul Broker discovered was that this patient suffered enormous damage to the left side of the inferior frontal gyrus pars orbitalis. And what that patient suffered from was something called expressive aphasia. Let me make sure you know things here. Uh, let me just go so I can see some of you. Aphasia, expressive aphasia, A-P-H-A-S-I-A. -A -A. That means an inability, expressive aphasia is an inability to express speech, okay? That's different from aphasia, which is A-P-H-A-G-I-A, -A, which is a reduction in food intake. So don't mix those two things up. So what do we, we're finding a couple of different things here. And of course, Broca's discovery went on and was replicated in many subjects and everything. So what he basically said, he found the quote unquote center for expressive speech, the ability of the individual to say something in the inferior frontal gyrus pars orbitalis. But I want you to look at the inferior frontal gyrus or pars orbitalis and recognize the fact that it is a, 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 an enormous structure with millions and millions of neurons, okay? So uh, that's what you're basically looking at there. And uh, again, an absolutely unbelievable discovery uh, for the time. So, uh, so we basically have now covered uh, the frontal lobe with the central, uh, uh, the central sulcus, the uh, precentral uh, pre gyrus, the precentral sulcus, the superior frontal gyrus, the superior frontal sulcus, the middle frontal gyrus, the inferior frontal sulcus, and then the pars opercularis, the pars triangularis, and the pars orbitalis of the inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, where is my thing here? All right, so we covered all of those. So now we go to the temporal lobe and the lateral surface. So now what is the temporal lobe? The temporal lobe is uh, on the lateral surface of the brain is anything that is inferior to the lateral sulcus. <clears throat> so what we're going to get here is the whole idea of four gyri, so therefore three sulci. So we're going to have a superior temporal gyrus, a superior temporal sulcus. More inferior, we go to a middle temporal gyrus and a middle temporal sulcus. Then we go to the inferior temporal gyrus, and then we go to the inferior temporal sulcus and the parahippocampal gyrus, but we don't see that because 
when we hit the inferior temporal gyrus, we're at the bottom of the lateral sulcus. So now we're going to go to the inferior surface, and then we're going to go to the medial surface. So let's start to look at that. So here, again, is the lateral sulcus. And here, the sort of very big sausage thing here is the superior temporal gyrus, okay? Now, 1870, I started out as a historian. So in 1870 in France, France was very busy at that point, And it was a Franco-Prussian war that was going on. And of course, here we have in science, the French neurologist Paul Broca identifying the structure within uh, the brain for expressive aphasia. Uh, what I pointed out, by the way, I neglected to say something. There were two things that um, Paul Broca discovered. Because if you remember, what I said was that the lesion that he found was what? Uh, 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 relegated to the left inferior frontal gyrus pars orbitalis. The right was okay. Yet this person suffered from expressive aphasia. So not only did Paul Broker identify this large area of the brain for this very, very important neuropsychological function, but what he also did was demonstrate the importance of laterality. That, uh, and what has turned out is the following. If you're right-handed, very often the information that's going on controlling the right side, et cetera, is on the left side of the body. I'll talk about that later. And what basically, and if you're left-handed, um, that's uh, uh, the left hand is controlled by the right side of the body. What basically happened in many, many cases after this is that if there was a person that was right-handed dominant and suffered expressive aphasia, that, and, and the damage was discrete, it didn't go to both sides, that basically 95% of the cases, the damage was relegated to the left uh, pars orbitalis of the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, however, if a person is left-hand uh, dominant, basically it's a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the patients, if they show discrete lesions, will show it on the left side, 50% will show it on the right side. And we'll talk about that in a little interesting way. But here let's talk about the stupid Franco-Prussian War and what the hell is he talking about with that? Uh, because in 1871, the Franco-Prussian War was still going on. But the Germans were not gonna get outdone by Paul Broker and the French for identifying uh, expressive aphasia. What a, 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 a neurosurgeon in Germany named Karl Wernicke, W-E-R-N-I-C-K-E, -E, basically made the following discovery. That what Wernicke found is that he had a patient with a discrete lesion of the superior temporal gyrus on the left side. And the su uh, superior temporal gyrus was known to be the primary auditory area. And what he found with that patient was that patient suffered from, with the lesion of this area, suffered from receptive aphasia. So with expressive aphasia, the patient has the inability to uh, express speech, but they can understand speech. If a person has pure 
receptive aphasia, the person has the, in, the ability to express speech, but the inability to understand speech. Now you have to understand in 90% of stroke patients that have some form of aphasia, what they typically have is global aphasia, both receptive and expressive. But in these uh, classic uh, case reports back uh, 150 years ago, you had the discovery that you could separate receptive aphasia into a destruction of primary auditory cortex in the superior temporal lobe and expressive aphasia uh, in uh, pars orbitalis of the inferior frontal gyrus. So now we have the, um, we have, uh, the uh, lateral sulcus, we have the superior temporal gyrus. You can call it functionally primary auditory cortex. You can uh, talk about it in terms of a receptive speech. And then a third, a fourth term is called Heschel's gyrus. H-E-S-H-Y-L, Heschel's gyrus. So then what we have is uh, inferior to the superior temporal gyrus is the superior temporal sulcus. Then we have the middle temporal gyrus, the middle temporal sulcus. And what we can see right here is just a little bit of inferior, front, uh, inferior temporal gyrus. And then we would go on the medial side and see that fourth part of the temporal lobe, which is the parahippocampal gyrus that I'm not gonna look at right now. So, okay, where did my pointer go? Come on. There. Okay. So we have, we've covered all of these things, Heschel, Wernicke, primary auditory core. So you can see four names for that structure. Superior temporal gyrus, Heschel's gyrus, Wernicke's area, primary auditory cortex. It's just a good thing just to know in your head. Okay, so now we go to the parietal and occipital lobes in the lateral surface. And we're going to be looking at the parietal lobe, the postcentral gyrus, the superior parietal lobule, the inferior parietal lobule, the angular gyrus, and uh, the occipital. So, and I already see I made a mistake here. On this slide, if you're looking, superior parietal lobule is um, uh, uh, basically going to be getting, um, it's going to be getting uh, temporal occipital types of information. So, what basically is going to be happening here is that this is a visual association area, whereas the inferior parietal lobule is auditory association area. Then we're going to see the angular gyrus and we're going to see the occipital pole. So here is the lateral surface again. And we see the lateral, uh, we see the lateral sulcus. And here you are out there laterally on a superior surface. You can see the angular gyrus. You can see the superior parietal lobule. And you can see the inferior parietal lobule. Superior parietal lobule, inferior parietal lobule, angular gyrus. Superior temporal gyrus middle temporal gyrus. So now what starts to happen? The superior parietal lobule starts to not only get information from the postcentral gyrus, which is what? Somatosensory. But the superior parietal lobule also integrates information from the occipital lobe. So what are you putting together here in that parietal lobe? Remember what I talked about associations. We are having association between touch and vision. And you have very interesting types of neurons in here 
that can integrate those two things. Whereas the inferior parietal lobule is wonderfully positioned to get information, somatosensory information coming in this way, but it also gets auditory information coming in this way from the superior temporal. So what does the uh, inferior parietal lobule then get is associations between uh, somatosensory and auditory uh, associations. And then what you basically then see is the occipital lobe that we're not differentiating right here. And then of course we have the cerebellum. And then when we look down here below the cerebellum, we're seeing sub areas of the subcortex, the medulla uh, and the pons and the midbrain. Okay. So now we go here and here we have the lateral surface of the brain. So the two things, oh, okay, somebody left, getting it back in, there we go. So we have two major, uh, uh, major gyro, uh, uh, sulci that we're looking at, which is the uh, lateral uh, sulcus, and we're looking at the central sulcus. So we are looking at the frontal lobe again, which is rostral to the central sulcus and superior to temporal sul uh, uh, excuse me, uh, um, the frontal lobe is rostral to the central sulcus and superior to the lateral sulcus. We have the parietal lobe, which is uh, 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 caudal to the central sulcus and superior to the lateral sulcus. And we have the temporal lobe, which is inferior to, tempor uh, uh, to the uh, lateral sulcus. So when we look at the central, uh, uh, central sulcus, we see the post precentral gyrus. We then see the uh, precentral sulcus. And then we see the superior frontal, the middle frontal, and the huge inferior frontal gyri and the inferior frontal gyri have the pars opercularis, the pars triangularis, and the very large pars orbitalis. When we're at the lateral surf, uh, we're at the temporal lobe, we have the superior temporal gyrus, the superior temporal sulcus, the middle temporal gyrus, the middle temporal sulcus, and a little bit and a little bit of the um, inferior, uh, inferior temporal gyrus. Then we have the occipital lobe and the cerebellum. So again, we've just gone through a rather large number of structures that uh, one can observe on the in, uh, lateral surface. So now we're gonna go to the inferior surface where it is a bit more important, but let me stop right here for a second to see, yes, there are some questions about the lateral surface. Heschel's, Heschel's area is also known as, uh, 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 and you'll see the spelling in my thing, Heschel's gyrus is also Wernicke's area, primary auditory cortex, and the superior temporal gyrus. Is the plan, general plan to go through without a break? Probably, okay. Uh, I just get going, I'm sorry. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions here. Okay, I think we covered them. Okay, so now I'm going to the inferior surface. And the inferior surface brings up other than the inferior surface itself, it brings up some other important concepts in the understanding of neuroanatomy and also of function. The first thing is encephalic levels and development. So what do I mean by the word encephalic? We're talking about the development of the head, okay? And the nervous system as it's related to the head and mostly the horizontal axis. And then development 
has to do from the, uh, 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 so in encephalic levels, and we're looking at the head, we're basically studying uh, phylogeny, P-H-Y-L-O-G-E-N-Y. And what is phylogeny? You're studying uh, organisms from a basic uh, simple level to a quote, higher and higher and higher level. So you're basically moving from an amoeba up to a human being. Ontogeny or development is development within a given species, but across time from birth uh, uh, all the way along. And the three major areas of development that we're gonna be looking at is early uh, prenatal development, late prenatal development, and then postnatal development. Then we're gonna be looking at the 12 cranial nerves. And the 12 cranial nerves, along with the 31 spinal nerves, provides for us both all of the major inputs and outputs of the brain communicating with virtually every aspect of the body. So we'll start off with the cranial nerves, and then when we get to the spinal cord, we will uh, go on from there. Then a third very important thing is looking at what is called the hypothalamo hyphen hypophyseal axis. So what does hypothalamo mean? It basically means the hypothalamus. We're gonna see that the hypothalamus is part of an area of the brain that we call the diencephalon. Then we see the hypophyseal. The hypophyseal uh, is a part of the pituitary gland. And what you're basically going to see is the pituitary gland is divided into anterior, intermediate, and posterior lobes. And the hypothalamus is gonna play very important roles in both anterior pituitary function, intermediate pituitary function, and posterior pituitary function. The other thing that's really important here, it looks very, very tiny. It takes up one sort of typewritten character. And that is the hyphen. Everybody see the hyphen. What can you assume 99.99% of the time? Whatever term comes before the hyphen is the source. And then anything that comes after the hyphen is the destination. So when we're talking about the hypothalamo hypophyseal axis, we're talking about fibers or we're talking about uh, uh, um, blood-borne uh, things that basically are moving from the hypothalamus into the pituitary. And we're gonna see this term not only uh, between these two struct uh, uh, structures, the hypothalamus and pituitary, but we're gonna see it neurally and everything. And it becomes very, very clear as to exactly what we're studying. Now, the hypothalamus, of course, is neural. The, hypo, uh, the hypophyseal or pituitary is hormonal. And the, so what we basically see with the hypothalamo hypophyseal axis is one part of the interaction between the nervous system and the hormonal system in modulating all types of functions. Then we're gonna come across another big word, peduncle. A peduncle is a massive set of fibers. So we're gonna see cerebral peduncle that is coming out of the cortex and going elsewhere. And then we're gonna see cerebellar peduncles that are both entering from the rest of the brain into the cerebellum, or alternatively, moving from the cerebellum to the rest of the brain. Okay, so peduncles are um, uh, large, large fiber tracts. So 
encephalic development. So let's go and start to think about things and move not from uh, move not from um, a human being, but basically go to some very interesting creature like an earthworm. Okay. Now I grew up in New York City and um, uh, what was uh, now known as the Upper East Side, but back when I grew up it was called Yorkville. We didn't have too much dirt in, in New York City. So I, I, I compensate for that. I have a farm up here. Okay. But if you go up in a farm and you dig and everything like that, and you find an earthworm. And of course, the male of the species and a younger, I'm talking about human beings who dig up the earthworms, uh, may often uh, take this earthworm and conduct a horrific experiment called what would happen if. And that is, they take that earthworm and for some wacko reason, cut the earthworm in half. Okay, sounds gross. Happens with lots and lots of kids. They all grow up pretty normal. Okay, but the point of the matter, that happens. So our friend, the earthworm, if we were to take the two parts of that earthworm and we were to all of a sudden keep them and everything like that, in a lot of the cases, the two sides of the earthworm both died because the way the cut, it was a cut and everything like that, they, they both died. Then depending on the cut or something, uh, what you might find is one part of the earthworm survives, the other part of the earthworm doesn't. Again, again the nature of the cut. But what you can actually happen is that you can actually cut an earthworm very surgically and then keep the thing okay. And all of a sudden, what happens? You now have two earthworms. And you have two earthworms that work perfectly fine. And what, how do you know about an earthworm working perfectly fine? Is that an earthworm uh, breathes, it has uh, warmth, it eats, and it defecates. Okay, boom, <laughs> able to go and do that. And you go, well, how? Well, the point is, is that an earthworm in a lot of ways has a nervous system that is sort of like the Articles of Confederation in uh, the American colonies. And that was, is that you had 13 different states and for that brief period of time from 1783 to 1787, uh, these states operated under what was called the Articles of Confederation. But well, what did they basically discover by 1786? This group of states wanted to do this, this group of states wanted to do that. And unless they wanted to become 13 different countries, which they could have done, um, they decided they wanted to go all together and they created a thing called the Constitution with John, uh, James Madison. And then in 1789, they created a federal thing and the presidency and there was George Washington. So what did you basically have? Is you went from a thing where you have um, a, uh, throughout the earthworm's body, you have a group of nuclei and then a group of fibers. Now, those group of nuclei at a particular point in the earthworm's body innovated and controlled that part of the earthworm which allowed then the uh, earthworm uh, to move that part of the body because it sort of slithers along. However, the connection between uh, these groups of nuclei, which we call ganglia, G-A-N-G-L-I-A or L-I-O-N, uh, usually we use that term for a group of neurons that are a nuclei outside of the CNS, okay? So that's where, so we have sympathetic ganglia and things like that, and we'll talk about that, but they have that ganglia. And then those ganglia are connected to one another, and that allows that earthworm to move in different directions and do whatever. Oh, so great. I'm not sure I followed the metaphor. <laughs> I know I do some bizarre, I have free association. Some of you are probably 
uh, psychoanalytic and you think I'm nuts. No, okay, <laughs> what do I mean? Is that the colonies, they, if they, uh, they were connected, but they were moving in different directions. So in order to go and do something with the earthworm, it was the colonies under the Articles of Confederation. And you're not sure, you're li very limited in where you can go and move because as we can all basically say, earthworms have a re relatively limited existence. So what do we basically have to do when we went to the constitution is the whole idea of having three different, uh, we had different levels of government, state government versus federal government, then federal government had a uh, Congress, a legislative, executive and judicial branch, and all of these things got allocated. So what basically happened, especially with the judicial branch, with a guy like John Marshall as uh, one of the uh, first very powerful chief justices, gave more and more power to the federal branch. Think of the federal branch as encephalic development, because what we did as we moved up the phylogenetic scale, and it, it didn't take long, because if you're digging in the dirt and you un, uh, uh, dig out an earthworm, what you can also do if you're in a if you're in the right area geographically is you could dig out another worm called a planaria. Everybody remembers sort of what a planaria looks like. It sort of has a, a greater a head and then it moves down into a tail. Obviously, if you cut a planaria in half, um, you're either going to kill both sides or you're going to kill the tail side. The tail side does not grow back into a second planaria simply because in phylogenetic development, we now started to create um, uh, areas. And, and again, what do we do when we're uh, trying to interact? We don't go pull down our uh, pants and expose our backsides, you know, the caudal end to figure out the world. We use our heads to figure out the world because the encephalic development went that way. So now let's go and look at that. So what we have right here with these terms is I have, if you notice, one, two, and three terms that have dots next to them. These three terms, the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon, is the, are the uh, uh, primal structures as we move in prenatal development from the first trimester into the second trimester and pretty much through the middle of the uh, second uh, trimester of a human uh, 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 neonate. So what you basically have is a rhombencephalon, which is caudal, a mesencephalon, which is in the middle, and then rostrally, we have the prosencephalon. Now, in the later part of the second trimester, the rhombencephalon now divides into two parts. So this most caudal portion of the central nervous system, which we now call the brain, now forms into a myelencephalon, caudally, and a metencephalon. So this caudal portion divides into two, portion, uh, two other areas, myelencephalon and metencephalon. The mesencephalon stays pretty much the same. So now in the second thing, we now have three structures, myelencephalon, metencephalon, and mesencephalon. And then the prosencephalon, again in that second trimester, uh, uh, subdivides into a diencephalon and a telencephalon. Now, Postnatally, the myelencephalon becomes what we now know of as the medulla and the cerebellum. The metencephalon becomes what we know as 
the pawns. The mesencephalon becomes what we know as is the midbrain. And then the telencephalon become, uh, excuse me, the diencephalon becomes what we know as the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And the telencephalon we get to know as the cortex, the basal ganglia, and the limbic system. So what you can basically see is in encephalic development, we go into um, three structures by the time that the brain is being uh, developed here, uh, rhombencephalon caudally, mesencephalon in the middle, prosencephalon rostrally, and then uh, they differentiate, the rhombencephalon differentiates into the myelencephalon and metencephalon. The mesencephalon stays the same. And then the prosencephalon uh, differentiates into diencephalon and telencephalon. And then you can see the potpourri of all of the structures that we know of postnatally that we uh, are going to go and identify. So now what I want you to do is look at this at, at uh, this inferior surface of the brain. And what I'm first of all going to basically do is identify for you uh, what we basically call uh, uh, the early prenatal. So remember, we had three parts. We had a rhombencephalon. What's the rhombencephalon? Here is the rhombencephalon, all of this. That's the whole rhombencephalon. Now, what is the mesencephalon? This little area on the inferior surface is the mesencephalon. Now, what is the prosencephalon? This to this to all of this to all of this. So now let's start to divide uh, in the last trimester. If you remember the rhombencephalon becomes the myelencephalon and the metencephalon. So the rhombencephalon becomes the myelencephalon, which becomes the medulla and the cerebellum. The rhombencephalon also becomes the uh, metencephalon, which right here in general is called the pons. The mesencephalon will eventually postnatally become the midbrain, although we're only looking at the inferior surface here. And then the prosencephalon becomes um, the diencephalon, and that's this tiny area right here. And all we can see in here is the hypothalamus, but above it would be the thalamus. And then the uh, uh, prosencephalon also becomes the what? It becomes the, uh, the whole cortex. We don't see the basal ganglia. We, we don't see the, um, uh, uh, the limbic system. But those are uh, the whole thing of encephalic development. And as you can see, as we move rostrally, uh, the encephalic development has developed um, in some way, shape, or form, um, much more exponentially uh, as we moved even further rostrally, with the telencephalon having the largest amount of phylogenetic and ontogenetic development. Okay, so now. So now we covered that. So now what I want to do is cover the cranial nerves. So the first thing I'm going to do, okay, good, is I'm going to look at the cranial nerves. 
And of course, what I have here, even though we're in five columns, we have six pieces of information, okay? We have a cranial nerve number. We have a cranial nerve name. We then have the level of the nervous system in which the cranial nerve is found. Then we have what is called type. And we're gonna divide this type into three categories, sensory, motor, and mixed. And also with type, I have basically a one or two word descriptor of what that cranial nerve does, what its function is. So under type, you have both type and function. And then what I have is the path that the cranial nerve is going to take. So you might go, all right, Bodner, I understand that we want to know we want to associate the numbers with the names so that we know that the first cranial nerve is called olfactory. That's uh, fine. And maybe it's good to know what the cranial nerve does. Yes, that's all well and good. But why the F do we have to know what type of cranial nerve is it is, uh, where it is, at what level, and what path it takes? There's a method to my madness. What's basically going to happen is we're gonna be able to use the cranial nerves. Once we see the cranial nerves and identify them, when we get to the medulla, uh, the pons, and the midbrain, and the diencephalon structures, we're gonna be literally able to identify those cranial nerves and their paths, and it will basically inform us as to exactly where they are and where they go. So, uh, like I said, there are certain things in a quote unquote essay that you may have to know, like with the encephalic development, you may have to know that there were uh, uh, three different things in early development that became five things. And then what are those five things elaborated postnatally? The cranial nerves, you want to see these six pieces of information. So what is there? There's 72 pieces of information here that I just want you to know. Okay, so the first cranial nerve is olfactory, and it is the only cranial nerve in the telencephalon. What type of cranial nerve is it? It's a sensory cranial nerve. Now, there is a word, let me come out of here for a second, just looking at you again. There's a word, when we use the word sensory, we use another word and very often people use, in, uh, use it as an oxymoron. It's called a sensory afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. An afferent is an input going towards the brain, okay? And by definition, anything going towards the brain is gonna have some sensory characteristic, which is why I call a sensory afferent an oxymoron. Now, what we're also gonna come up with very soon by the time we get to the third cranial nerve is we're gonna now use a word called motor. That it is a, this cranial nerve is motor and therefore it is an motor efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. And the whole point of a motor efferent is that cranial nerve is controlling some set, subset of muscles somewhere that allow you to do an action, okay? So we're gonna have, we're gonna have a, a sensory type of cranial nerves and you'll see who they are. We're going to have motor efferents. We're going to see what they are. And, uh, and then we are then going to do a third category, which is called a mixed cranial nerve. What is a mixed cranial nerve? A mixed cranial nerve is a cranial nerve that has both sensory afferents 
and motor efferents, okay? And we'll basically look at that. Okay, I see I have like a million chats here. What do you mean? I remember afferent versus efferent by thinking of the word same. Okay, there you go. I can see what she means. SA is a sensory afferent. ME is a motor efferent. There you go. Congratulations. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, you love that. And by the way, all of these things... By the way, in the old days, they had diff slightly different names for the cranial nerves. So you had these uh, mnemonics in which you, on old Olympus, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it doesn't pertain because they changed some of the names of the cranial nerves. So I'm not going to go and quote those things to you. Uh, okay, so now let me go to those cranial nerves. and. So we see that the olfactory, uh, olfactory nerve is in the telencephalon, it's sensory, it carries olfaction or smell information. And it will enter the nervous system medially. And we'll see that when we look at the, uh, when we look at the diagram. Optic, the optic nerve is the only one in the diencephalon, in fact, as the optic nerve enters the diencephalon, it is in the rostral portion of the diencephalon. It literally defines the diencephalon's rostral border. And of course, it too is sensory, and it is uh, obviously involved in vision. Now notice, notice where I say type, and it says sensory. Now notice the word path, it says, enters because the sensory is entering the brain. So it's entering the brain medially, the optic is entering the brain medially. Now we go to the oculomotor. Oculo eye, motor, controlling an eye muscle. It is the first of two cranial nerves found in the mesencephalon or midbrain. It is a pure motor uh, efferent, and it controls a number of different eye muscles. I'm not all you have to know is eye movements right now. I'll describe each one of them later. And it exits the brain medially. Then we come to the fourth cranial nerve, which is found in the caudal mesencephalon. It is called the trochlea. And it is the second of three cranial nerves that control eye movements, okay? Uh, oculomotor and trochlea both control different eye muscles for eye movements. The trochlea is wacko. It doesn't exit the brain medially or laterally. It actually exits the brain dorsally and then laterally. It comes out right behind the occipital lobe and the cerebellum. You're going to see that later on. So now we come to the fifth cranial nerve, which is the first of our mixed cranial nerves. It is found in the metencephalon or pons, and it is the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal because it has three branches an ophthalmic branch, a mandibular branch, and a maxillary branch that literally innervates the entire head and skull. And there's many, many functions involved with the trigeminal nerve. The one I put here is mastication, chewing, things like that. And it is a mixed cranial nerve. So, those three branches of the trigeminal nerve have both sensory afferents and motor efferents. So you're literally, you're literally getting sensory input, somatosensory input from many portions of the skull, and it is getting a motor uh, 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 efferent uh, that controls many parts of the skull. 
interestingly, I'll point this out later, you don't have to know this now, uh, one of the other uh, mechanisms for the trigeminal nerve is to control the tensor tympanic membrane. And where the hell is the tensor tympanic membrane? It is in the middle ear, right? In which you have your famous uh, hammer, anvil, and stapes, and this membrane will either tighten or relax. When it tightens, sound waves are much more sharp. When it relaxes, sound waves become muffled. And that is controlled not by the eighth cranial nerve, but by the fifth cranial nerve. And that's, that has a lateral path. Then the sixth cranial nerve is, the, is in the metencephalic, myelencephalic border. It is motor. And it is the third of the three cranial nerves that control eye movements, and it exits the brain medially. So now let's look at those. Let's look at those um, uh, 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 six cranial nerves. So, if you remember anything rostral to here is telencephalon. So I told you there was one cranial nerve that's in the telencephalon. Here it is. Here's the olfactory nerve. And the olfactory nerve is entering, it's sensory. And notice how it enters the brain medially, okay? And it's controlling uh, the sense of smell, okay? Then we have the second cranial nerve, which I defined as being in the diencephalon. And what you can see, it's in the rostral diencephalon. In fact, on the inferior surface of the brain, we separate the diencephalon from the telencephalon by the second cranial nerve. And the second cranial nerve is optic. And the second cranial nerve enters the brain medially. Now, we are a human being sitting outside my do door uh, and window right here is a barn because um, uh, my wife and I share this house with three cats and we have two donkeys and four sheep and now seven chickens. And I'm gonna talk about chickens here for a minute because they do a, a much better understanding of the visual system. So rather than running around with my computer to show you a chicken, I'm hoping you're imagining it. And if you basically look at a chicken, you recognize that the chicken's eyes are sitting laterally on that very narrow head that they have. So basically what happens is information from the left eye of a chicken, which is very, very interesting because of its placement, that chicken can literally see 180 degrees, whatever's on to the left of them, okay? And of course, they can see above and they can see below. They see below, so they're pecking all the time and knowing how to go and do it, and seeing above to look for predators like hawks and eagles and things like that, which we have had. Okay, so, but that chicken, the left eye, uh, and we'll go through this in detail, and I'm hoping you had this undergraduate, is that the, uh, the, the left eye, the information comes into the retina, to the rods and the cones, goes to the bipolar cells, goes to the ganglion cells, and then the output of those ganglion cells form the optic nerve. Now, notice I use the word nerve, because where we are, is we are outside the central nervous system. So hence, very typically, we use the word nerve for fibers that are outside the central nervous system. And then once we get inside the central nervous system, we call it a tract, T-R-A-C-T, -A okay? So, so the information from the left eye and the right eye come in, they go back and they get into that rostral diencephalon and what do you see? What you see is a structure called the optic chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M. In the case of a chicken, at the optic chiasm, 
all of the fibers of the left eye cross over the midline and go into the right optic tract. Information from the right optic nerve crosses the optic chiasm and goes into the left optic tract. What does that do? When you eventually get back into the occipital cortex of a chicken, the information from the left uh, eye is going where? It is going into uh, the right hemisphere. Information from the right eye is going into the left hemisphere, okay? So the chicken has a complete decussation. Now, we, and by the way, one of the other creatures I just mentioned to you have a different organization, and that is our friend the hawk. If you go and you look at a hawk, you're not, and you're looking the hawk in the eye, the hawk is looking back at you. Why? Because both of its eyes are forward looking just like our own. And what does this forward looking aspect do? Well, bad thing is you can't look behind you anymore. You have to turn your head, okay? Remember the chicken can see 180 degrees on either side uh, and they're prey and that's probably a good thing for them to do. But looking forward, you now have uh, information going into the left eye and the right eye. And you might be fixed on some object in the center. And the point of the matter is, is as some focal point is out there and the animal, uh, and we are seeing this, um, it is hitting our two retinas on the left and right eyes to a certain degree so that information to the right of the center is going into the temporal portion of our right eye and the lateral portion of our left eye. Information in the left visual field is going into the medial portion of our left eye and the temporal portion of our right eye. So importantly, and you probably know this, is if all of a sudden you have some irritation, you have to cover one of your eyes, you see both visual fields. If you cover uh, uh, the eye of a chicken, half the world is gone. And now the chicken has to, but chickens don't run around wearing patches. Okay, so in any case, so now, now that information is coming in and you have information from both visual fields in each eye, and it now enters the optic nerve. So now when it enters the optic nerve, uh, only a portion of these, uh, of these fibers will cross. So now let's get to the word cross. What we do is we use the word decussation, D-E, C-U-S-S-A-T-I-O-N, decussation. Now don't confuse that with desiccation. I've seen that on exams. Desiccation is tissue drying. Decussation is crossing the midline. So in the case of a chicken, the optic nerve becoming the optic tract is the result of 100% decussation everything crossed. In the case of a human being, only 50% of the fibers cross, and it is the medial 50%. So if you remember, in the right visual field, you had uh, it going into the medial portion of the left eye, the lateral portion of the right eye. So now that medial portion crosses and joins that lateral portion. So you're gonna have left input and right input. And we're gonna get into this when we get into the thalamus with lateral geniculate body, how we sort all of this stuff out. So you're getting uh, information from the two eyes and there's a 50% decussation. The 50% that doesn't decussate is that lateral portion of the optic nerve that just be, continues to become the optic tract, and the rest of the optic tract is a result of the medial decussations. That goes back to the thalamus, the lateral geniculate body, and then goes eventually back to the occipital cortex. So that is how this uh, uh, important information uh, gets in there, 
and a, uh, a, a, a you know, uh, the second cranial nerve. So now, yeah, well, all we're doing, I think the question was the optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, what you're basically doing is uh, with the optic nerve, this portion right here, this has information from both visual fields. This is information from both visual fields. But when you're back here in the optic tract, now you have information from only the contralateral visual field. We're gonna go through that again for this point in time. It's not, you're not gonna get quizzed on it, so don't worry about that. So now let's go to the third cranial nerve, which you remember is found in the midbrain. And here we are, we have the ocular motor. And the ocular motor is what? It is a, um, it is a, a, a motor nerve, and it's gonna be exiting the brain medially, and it's gonna be innovating a whole series of eye muscles that I'll describe once we get uh, uh, into the lectures about the pons in the midbrain, et cetera. The fourth cranial nerve, oh my God, where the hell's the fourth cranial nerve? Oh yeah, the fourth cranial nerve is not on the inferior surface of the brain because it exited the brain dorsally and then laterally. So now we get to the fifth cranial nerve. And the fifth cranial nerve right here, I get my cursor going again, is the trigeminal. The trigeminal is the second largest of all the cranial nerves. It has both a sensory and motor component. And what we see is the major portion of the trigeminal can be found in the pons, but some of its nuclei go all the way up into the midbrain, and some of its nuclei go all the way down into the spinal cord. It's a huge cranial nerve, but the largest amount of it is found uh, in the pons, and it has both a sensory component and a motor component. Then we go to the sixth cranial nerve, which is the abductions. And the abductions is the third of three cranial nerves that are involved in uh, eye movement. So it's a motor nerve. It is found, as you can see, right on here is the metencephalon or pons. Here is the myelencephalon or a medulla, and it's found right on the pontine medullary border, and it's exiting the brain medially. Okay, so now we go to cran cranial nerve 7 to 12. We will, by the way, finish with the, uh, this part of the lecture today. And uh, first of all, to make things life much easier, Notice in cranial nerves seven to 12, all of them are found in the myelencephalon, all of them are therefore found in the medulla. So the seventh cranial nerve is known as the facial nerve. It is a mixed cranial nerve. Uh, it controls the face and it controls the inner portion of the mouth and whatever, and of course, first third of the tongue, and therefore it is intimately involved in the sensation of taste, and it has a lateral path. So both the sensory and motor portions uh, work along this lateral path. The eighth cranial nerve used to be known as the auditory nerve. Uh, to be more specific, it is now called the vestibular cochlea nerve. It is in the myelencephalon, and it is a sensory cranial nerve, and it is involved in audition through its cochlear component, but it is also involved in position sense and balance with its vestibular component, okay? And it enters the brain laterally. Then the ninth cranial nerve is called the glossopharyngeal nerve. It is a mixed cranial nerve. 
a sensory afferent, motor efferent, controlling the larynx and the pharynx. So it's very, very important in things like digestion. It's also very, very important in things like speech or making any kind of utterance. So if I walk out to my chicken, uh, 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 chickens now, uh, they'll talk to me by going buck, 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 buck. They always want money. Okay, funny. Okay, uh, but they need a larynx and a pharynx in order to uh, do their buck, buck, buck. I need it to make this lecture. So there is a lateral path. Then we have the vagus nerve, which is the largest cranial nerve. And it is again, a mixed cranial nerve, sensory afferents, motor efferents, exiting the brain laterally. Now, basically, uh, I will talk about things in terms of a so-called Mason-Dixon line, you know, something that separates the North and the South. Um, basically, think about your body, think about the trunk of your body, and think about a structure called the diaphragm. The diaphragm, I'm gonna go and uh, do stop share so I can see what the hell I'm doing right here. The diaphragm is basically here and it is separating uh, the respiratory portion and cardiovascular portion of vagal uh, preferences to uh, a subdiaphragmatic area, which is primarily involved in digestion, some degree of excretion, et cetera. So very often we take the vagus nerve and we separated it into the, sub, the supradiaphragmatic vagus and the subdiaphragmatic vagus. The supradiaphragmatic vagus may have some effects on heart rate, tachycardia, and bradycardia. And then it has certain effects on uh, a, a lung function in terms of hyperventilating or uh, doing slow ventilation. The subdiaphragmatic branch of the vagus is then uh, getting all kinds of sensory inputs and motor outputs to the stomach, the gastric branch, the intestine, the celiac branch, the liver, the hepatic branch, the pancreas, the pancreatic branch, the gallbladder, a whole bunch of other structures that are involved in digestion that get both vagal afferents going up to the brain and vagal efferents that come from the brain and then signal um, uh, those particular functions. So then, we go to the 11th cranial nerve and it is the spinal accessory. So the spinal accessory, uh, I always like to call the, uh, again, shows you how long I've been teaching. In 1981, this sort of ridiculous looking uh, guy who was uh, a long time comedian, all of a sudden broke into public consciousness. That guy's name was Rodney Dangerfield. He broke into the con uh, consciousness by, uh, by uh, doing a National Lampoon movie called Caddyshack, okay? And the whole thing about Rodney Dangerfield is his shtick always was saying, I don't get no respect, okay? And the spinal accessory is the Rodney Dangerfield of, of cranial nerves. Why? First of all, it's the smallest cranial nerve. Second of all, uh, all of these cranial nerves, as you're going to learn, uh, obviously I'm having them entering the brain and exiting the brain and doing things like that. Well, it's nice to enter the brain and exit the brain. You also have to enter and exit something else. And that something else is called a skull. And as you look with most skulls is a skull is this bony encasement. So how the hell do you get these nerves past those bony encasement? 
It's because this bony encasement has something called a foramen, F-O-R-A-M-E-N. That's pure, plural, I mean singular. Foramina is plural. What is a foramen or foramina? It's a hole or a holes within the, uh, the skull. So the olfactory nerve, as the olfactory nerve will enter through an olfactory foramina into the skull, into the brain. Optic, the same thing. All of these things are sort of are entering various aspects of the skull. So the spinal accessory is so small that it uses the same foramen as the, as the, um, uh, 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 as the vagus. So that's why I mean, it doesn't have much respect. It exits the brain laterally, but what it does is control something called the branchiomeric arch. And the branchiomeric arch is sitting right at the very top of the lungs, okay? And just like the diaphragm is sitting way at the bottom of the lungs. And uh, if there's somebody who has, I can name uh, uh, three guys that have probably wonderful spinal accessory nerves. They were called the three tenors, okay? And all of a sudden, you know, Pavarotti and uh, the other guys, they're just singing and holding notes and you have uh, all of the female opera singing, singers singing those Wagnerian operas, holding this note for this incredible amount of time. And what you probably have is a wonderfully highly developed uh, spinal accessory nerve. And that's what that basically does. It's involved in breath and holding the breath and things like that. Then the 12th cranial nerve is the hypoglossal and it is a motor nerve and it is in the po it controls the posterior two thirds of the tongue. So whereas the anterior one third of the tongue is very much involved in taste and, and uh, literally movement of positioning the tongue in speech against the palate, the posterior two thirds of the tongue is, far, is much more important than a basic homeostatic motor function, which is something called swallowing. So it, eg it exits the brain medially. So if we take these cranial nerves and now look at that, here, if you remember, we'll very quickly go, the olfactory first, the, uh, the uh, optic second, the uh, ocular motor third, we don't see the trochlea, the uh, trigeminal is fifth, the abductions is sixth. Right over here, the most rostral of these right here is the facial. Then right here, you can see it splitting into two parts is the vestibular cochlea. Then behind that is the glossopharyngeal. Then we have the largest cranial nerve, the vagus. Then we can see the spinal accessory. And then what we can see right here is the hypoglossal. So there are the 12 cranial nerves uh, going all along this area that is extremely important in um, uh, encephalic development. You can put those two things together because what are you starting to do with higher and higher levels of encephalic development whereupon the telencephalon, uh, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, the metencephalon, and myelencephalon took on far further and further roles what did you also do? You got into higher and higher levels of specialization. And you can basically see that right here on the inferior surface of the brain. So uh, there was something that uh, I was very happy about um, about a month or two ago. Um, a guy by the name of Gary Larson released three more cartoons. Back through the 80s and into the mid 90s, Gary Larson 
would amaze us every day with a cartoon called The Far Side. And of course, he had ridiculous looking animals doing things. He had ridiculous looking people doing things. He had just ridiculous types of activities. And they have many, many books where you can literally look at all of Gary Larson's cartoons as a function of, uh, of, 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 of uh, by uh, the topic that he did. There's one classic cartoon that's apropos to this very, very moment as I got to 1204. And that is you have kids sitting in a classroom and you have this sort of amorphous looking kid, really doofusy looking kid with one of these sort of striped shirts. And as Gary Larson would always do, he'd have a pair of glasses on, the, uh, on anybody. And when they had the pair of glasses, they, you can't see the eyes, you just see the glasses, okay? So in any case, uh, uh, he's looking and he has his hand up. And the little quotation for the day is, teacher, may I be excused, my brain is full. And I basically figure for some, if not all of you, uh, this is um, uh, uh, probably the type of course that I'm try trying to go through, I'm trying to build. I can't take it tiny little pieces at a time simply because of the goddamn organization of the brain, but we're taking it bit by bit by bit. So one of the things is, a very important thing at the beginning of the next class, and I just can't do this anymore in a remote session, but what I would do if you were all sitting in a big classroom and you're all around the class, the next class I'd go in and as I take some of those slides and I point at things and point at somebody and say, what's this, what's that, what's this, what's that, what's the other thing, what's this, what's that, all of that crap. and. I, I take like two or three seconds. If the person answered it correctly, great. If the person didn't answer it, if the person just sat there, I move to the next person and eventually review. So one of the things that I want you to do is if you have questions and you may have during this thing, you can either write as a big group email to people. And by the way, I know when I run my uh, lab and everything, I have like seven or eight people in my lab. Um, very often they're communicating with themselves totally separate from me because they don't want to involve me at all. And they're uh, uh, you know, uh, interacting with one another. To, the whole point here is to ask questions. My, uh, I think I said this in my opening statement that my oldest son went through some degree of special education in the first thing. And the best thing that ever happened to him academically as a as a, a person he had this teacher who basically went and taught in special education in middle school two concepts know what you don't know and then ask questions and hopefully if you know what you don't know and you're not sure you can ask me there is no such thing as a stupid question here because if you have that question there's probably other people uh, uh, to uh, to do this, so uh, so in any case, uh, that's uh, what um, uh, I'm asking you to do here, and what it may automatically do is slow us up. I do have room in that course near the end, so if we, I'd rather move along slower, where everybody's sort of getting it then move through because it's sort of like in a stat course. If you don't know the gross neuroanatomy, when you get into the specific stuff, you're gonna go nuts. Whereas I'm hoping that you get to know this uh, sooner than later. So here we go. That was uh, three hours and 10 minutes. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, 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 there I go here. I just don't know sort of what else to do. Um, have a very good uh, first, uh, I hope you had a good first class, or if you want to run away from here screaming, go ahead and do that. Uh, but uh, whatever, uh, uh, hopefully we'll move on from here.
and continue with the inferior surface the next time and move along. So again, have a good week. If you want to contact me by email, uh, certainly we'll do the thing with the chats and everything. And I'll see you next week. So at this point, I'm going to end this meeting. See ya.